So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about tonight is uh, the history of life um, and a little bit about what it means to all of you sitting here right now. So um, sensory, our senses are really important for us because they're the way that the world interacts with us and actually the way that uh, we interact with the world. And the only way that the world, or at least the living parts of it, know of us is through their senses. And they're so familiar to us, so embedded in who we are every day, that it's sometimes hard to remember that they haven't always been here, right? So they didn't just emerge from a vacuum, right? Our senses emerged here on Earth, and they emerged in the past. So they emerged over the last four billion years or so that life has been on this planet. And one of the real important things to appreciate is that we are all related to things that were alive about four billion years ago. And humans aren't special in that way. Everything that's alive today is related to stuff that was back on the early Earth. And what that really means is that if you had like a time machine and you could go to any moment over the last four billion years, there would be some relatives to visit, right? Um, they may not look a lot like you, they may not sound a lot like you, but they're related to you nonetheless. I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Um, but in any case, what it means is that those relatives were incredibly successful. And that means they were able to survive, they never went extinct. And one way that they did this was that they were incredibly good at dealing with the changes that they face. And the world is constantly changing, and that actually has opportunities as well as challenges. And one way that organisms have done this is they have developed incredibly sophisticated systems for figuring out what's going on around them so that they can reorganize their behavior or reorganize their physiology to deal with these challenges. And so you can find evidence for that in the fossil record. And you'll see lots of evidence of different sensory transduction things that you can recognize, like eyes and things in the rocks. But the problem with looking at rocks is that some of that information isn't there. And th what I mean, some of the key information you want is that really uh, what you pass on to your children and what all organisms have passed on to their ancestors, you don't pass on your ear or your nose or your eyes, right? What you pass on is the information to create those things. And that means the genes, that means the DNA. And while rocks are really good at recording the hard parts of an animal, they're not so good at recording the DNA. And so you can't get the genes out of a 10 million year old fossil, right? So what that means is all the real information you wanna know about how we really came to be is all gone. So what do you do with that? Well, it, you can actually do something because there's a lot of DNA around to examine and there are a lot of living creatures, right? And so since we know that all of what we see around us, all the living creatures are all derived from common ancestors. If we can just get our hands on enough of those genes and understand how they work in the modern organisms, we can kind of back calculate back in history and get at least a, a general glimmer, a glimpse of how these things emerged and, and what they did back in the day. So there are many ways to enter this question. And the way that I personally do this and the, the people in my lab do this is that we study how this organism, a fruit fly, senses the world. And while fruit flies might seem like trivial little things to you or annoyances, they actually have incredibly rich inner lives. Um, they wake up in the morning, they get sleepy at night. Uh, the males sing to the females to try to convince them to mate with them, and the females are incredibly picky about whether they'll allow them to mate or not. Um, the other thing is that flies are really picky eaters, and my lab takes advantage of that, because you can think of a fly a little bit like Will Ferrell, an elf, because it really likes sugar. So what you're about to see is a picture of a fly, or actually a movie of a fly, if it starts to move. There we go. Um, and what we're about to do is we're about to come at this fly with a big ball of sugar. Okay, and there we go, sorry. Uh, and what you'll see is that the fruit fly, when it's confronted with some sugar, will get very excited and have a big meal. And it doesn't have teeth, it just has a little tube that it sucks through, right? And it's gonna suck that stuff up and it'll really enjoy it. The thing is though, that what we've done is kind of mean, because what we actually did was we stuck some wasabi in there. 
Um, and so the first time it's fine, but the next time we come back, the fruit fly isn't quite as enthusiastic. And you'll see that it really, really doesn't want what we're serving. Um, and so, you know, that means that the fly is a pretty smart little organism. So how does it do this? How does it know that it shouldn't be eating this stuff? Well, actually, you have little taste buds in your mouth, and the fruit fly has it, but they're on the outside, or at least some of them are on the outside, and they're in these black little bristles that you see here, and that that's what you've been listening to, or that David has, and his colleagues have modified, are the, the senses, the, the songs that these little spikes, uh, that these little neurons that are in these black bristles are sending out. And so the way that it senses it is a little bit like the piano works which is that your finger presses down on a key, right? That swings a hammer that then hits a string and it vibrates and makes a note. You hit a different key, it activates a different hammer and that hits a different string and it vibrates a little bit different and makes a different sound. The way these nerves work is much the same way. Rather than the finger, there's a chemical, right? And rather than a key, there's a tiny little protein. And rather than opening and swinging a hammer, what that does is that opens a tiny little hole and it sets off an electrical discharge, which is some of the stuff that you've been listening to here. These little electrical discharges are actually interpreted by the brain. And it's a little bit like different keys on a piano. When you activate different nerves, different things happen. It interprets them differently. And it just so happens that if you touch one of these bristles with some wasabi, the signal that is sent is stop eating, right? Not surprisingly. And so it communicates with little nerves and it communicates with the muscles. And it tells it next time it's confronted with that, there's no way it should eat that. So that's how that works. But what does this actually have to do with the evolution of sensation? And I'll talk about that in a couple minutes.
So what does this have to do with the evolution of sensation? So it turns out that wasabi is a very special kind of chemical. It's not an uncommon chemical, it's just special. And what it does is it doesn't just sit on things, it interacts with them very physically. It's what's called a reactive chemical. It changes the chemical nature of things. And actually, these kinds of chemicals are incredibly common. Um, if you've ever seen anyone do the cinnamon challenge, they're essentially ingesting a ton of a very reactive chemical, very similar. It does the exact same thing as wasabi, and you know the consequences are, are dire. Um, you can find them in onions. You find them in cigarette smoke. When people are being tear gassed, they're being sprayed with this reactive, a reactive chemical. Okay. And what that does is it's not good for you. Right? A little bit is okay, a little spicy, uh, a little bit of a preservative because it kills things. But if you get enough of that, it binds to really important molecules and it really messes you up. And so animals have really figured out a good way to get around that. Now what is interesting and important about this is that these are not just in foods. They're not just condiments. It turns out that in your body, when your cells are damaged, what that does is that opens them up to the external environment in some ways. And what that does is that reactive oxygen and all that stuff that's in our environment begins to react with the components of your cells. And that generates reactive chemicals. And what your body has learned to do is to detect the presence of those kinds of chemicals inside of you as a warning signal that you have been damaged, your physical integrity has been compromised, and you feel it as pain. And so that is why you sense it as pain, because it is pain. Now, what's really fascinating about this is that all of these different chemicals are actually all recognized by one little molecule in your body, which is this thing called trip A1. Don't worry about the details. But what it really is, is it's a tiny little protein that sits in the membrane of many of your neurons. And whenever you get contacted by one of these reactive chemicals, it gets modified, and it opens up, and it sends a signal that something really bad is happening. And what's really important about this is that it doesn't just work this way in people. It works this way in flies, right down to the little amino acids, the molecular details. They're all the same. And it's not just flies and people. It's throughout the animal kingdom, right? So all kinds of invertebrates, invertebrates, no matter what you look at, almost all of them have this molecule, and it seems to do exactly the same job in all of those. And one thing that that really tells you is if, what do we know about everything that's alive today? Well, we all have a common ancestor. So if we all have exactly the same way of detecting these chemicals, it's very, very likely, in fact, it's probably true, that the common ancestor of all of these had this molecule, or a version of this molecule, and it was doing a very similar, if not an identical job. And what that means is kind of cool, I think, which is really that this fundamental linchpin in our ability to sense pain is really, really old. It means it's at least more than half a billion years old, and it means that it's been conserved for all of that time and everything that has existed. It was probably in the dinosaurs, right? They probably, if they happened to munch on a mustard green, if they were back then, um, they probably saw something very similar to what you feel today. Uh, and it means also that if you think about why we have all of these different senses, they all do different jobs. So our sense of smell is really, really good at distinguishing things. But it misses things, right? The, the very act of being discriminatory means that there are gaps in what you can sense. What this gives you is a way to not tell things apart, but to tell that you're being exposed to something nasty. And so in some ways, you don't care if you just drank hydrochloric acid or hydrofluoric acid, or you just ingested a whole bunch of cinnamon. What you really want to know is that you did something bad, and that you have to stop this. Right? You have to throw up, you have to cry, you have to get away. And that's really what this very old sense tells you. So the next time you go to the sushi bar, think about this. Right? What you're feeling is a very, very ancient burn. And it's a burn that is shared, at least in some form, by everything else around us. That's it. Thanks.